Thank you very much. Um, digital tools in HRV care. Who would have thought that would be a special session uh, like this? Uh, who would have thought so a few years ago? So I'm, I'm glad that we're going to spend uh, some time uh, on this. Um, like Katharina said, I'm uh, an HRV physician in Amsterdam. I'm an internist as well. And thanks, thanks to my nurses, uh, I can take care of roughly 800 persons living with HIV. The center takes care of 4,000 uh, people, but I also see people with diabetes, high blood pressure, and, and I uh, understand the, the challenges that we are facing in daily practice. Um, it was not a topic that I could simply take from the bookshelf. I really had to think about this. Uh, it's, it's a challenging uh, topic, but an important one if you ask me, and I uh, feel passionate about it. What I have to disclose is that uh, I took part in some advisory boards over the years, uh, but that I'm also <coughs> co-founder of the Happy App, one of the apps that I'm going to uh, present. Um, and like I said, I feel passionate about this uh, topic. I'm actually not very technically skilled, but if you ask me, I think I'm innovation minded and that I like to think more in solutions than in problems. And then you can always connect to people who like the technique behind it. So don't ask me how, how apps and other things are, are specifically made. And I'm not very interested, interested in developing uh, electronic health records, things like that. But I do know how to make uh, healthcare more efficient. I, I worked for Docs Without Borders in uh, several places, and I always like to go to a certain scene and then think, how could we improve this? Or how can I learn from this, uh, this place? Well, we, a few years ago, together with some colleagues, some friends, uh, we wrote down how we thought that e-health was actually already helping improve HIV-related care and how it could help potentially. Um, but it's a broad topic, and, and uh, so I'm a, I'm a believer. I'm maybe even uh, uh, somebody who kind of a, a front runner. There's always, of course, followers, and there are people who would like uh, not to change at all. Uh, we had elections yesterday in the Netherlands, and please don't ask me about the results, but that, that reminded me of that uh, again. Uh, but when we look at this, uh, you can see that there is uh, a difference in e-health uptake, if the pointer is working, otherwise you can see it uh, here, uh, that in, in Denmark there's more uptake than in France, for example, and some countries are, are not me uh, mentioned here. Uh, so there's a difference, I just want to mention that. And I want to mention that e-health uptake, what do we mean with that? Now here they looked in Germany, and, and well, if you read through the lines, you can see an uptake, because there's a quarterly report ending here in halfway 2021. But uh, um, using an online portal of a health insurance or, or making use of an electronic patient record, that already counts, counts for e-health uptake. And then you can see that there's a little place for disease-specific apps in Germany two years ago. But there's a trend that we start using digital tools more and more. Uh, but I already said digital tools and I said e-health. So back, back to the task the, uh, the chairman gave me. Uh, available digital tools, uh, very broad, a little bit fake, maybe even, and HIV care, that's a whole spectrum as well, of course. So I try to make that a little bit more clear. And then we can see uh, several definitions. Digital health is the use of digital technologies to improve health. Okay. Then e-health is used as well. Um, and what is that? That's the use of IT, information communication technologies for health. And then m-health is the use of mobile phones <coughs> or other wireless technology. And when we then go down, then the uh, European Observatory on Health Systems they state in 2021 that digital health had evolved over time and that you can uh, cut it into uh, M-Health, and you can see that here. Well, that, that could be uh, uh, health apps, fitness apps on personal phones, but it could also be mobile devices supporting the healthcare professionals. They say M-Health, E-Health, that's the electronic health records, uh, uh, medication that's being prescribed electronically, uh, uh, and telemonitoring, and there, uh, added to that nowadays is, is big data with machine learning, artificial intelligence. Uh, um, slowly, maybe even taking over, replacing, uh, um, for example, radiology and pathology uh, tasks in the hospital. There are pilots running now in our clinic. Um, Okay, digital tools. Now we know a bit more how we use terms like e-health, m-health, digital tools, and how about HIV care? Well, this is, this is easy stuff for you, for all of us, I think. 
but very broad. And, and we can, uh, to that normal continuum or cascade of care, we can add prevention. And there's, of course, the 490 or the 495 health-related quality of life that was mentioned earlier today as well, with many uh, topics to cover. So back to digital tools, uh, how could we divide it? I think you could uh, think of digital tools that facilitate healthcare professionals, and then you could think of uh, the electronic health record, for, for example. And I want to mention the Emerge app briefly. And I should have started also, by the way, by saying uh, the task was not easy because there's not a registry or anything. I, I don't think anyone knows about all the digital tools that are currently out there. So for sure, I'm going to forget or maybe even offend a person. And if people know uh, something more about an Emerge app or other apps, please, uh, please fill me in. Or uh, tell us about, uh, when, when there's time for questions, uh, tell us also about your experiences with digital tools. Now, so healthcare professional facilitating digital tools and digital tools that can empower the patients. And the electronic health record ideally does not only facilitate the doctor and the nurse and the pharmacist, but of course also empowers patients. And then uh, um, I'm going to touch upon four different apps for people living with HIV. Okay, then I made it more easy for myself. Uh, um, and I asked myself the question, how do digital tools help our own HIV practice? And I what I wanted to show here is, here you see the, the different years up to uh, 2022. And um, the light blue bar are the new patients and the red ones are the patients that are not in care anymore because they moved, because they died or because they were lost to follow up, which fortunately is less than 1% in, in our practice. But still you can see light blue is a little bit bigger than red. So uh, there is a decline in the Netherlands uh, when it comes to new cases, but our center is still growing. And like I said, we take care of roughly uh, 4,000 people uh, with a relatively small number of persons, if you ask me, because also our pharmacist, our data analyst, a medical microbiologist, where is he here? Uh, um, is shown on this picture and for sure part of the multidisciplinary team. And we have the challenge to uh, treat, and that was mentioned in, in former slides as well, to treat more patients with the same number or even less uh, doctors because uh, two of the HIV physicians, no one on the picture, but two the last four years retired and they were replaced by an oncologist and a nephrologist, not an infectious disease specialist. So a bigger number of patients, um, but also, of course, patients with more needs, more questions, the rare moments they come in. Um, now, how, then it would be nice if the electronic health record or digital tools help us to manage this in a good way. And I want to start with the electronic health record for healthcare providers. Uh, um, what does it show? And we use EPIC, an American uh, electronic health record. We have two big ones in, in our country, uh, Chipsoft and, and EPIC. Um, but what I can see at least when I'm preparing uh, the consultations, then here, for example, you see the creatinine over time, and we can do that with all the blood results. We can see the, the CT uh, uh, figures or, or the radiology, uh, the x-rays, etc. We can order different diagnostic tests, cultures, blood, urine, uh, scans, etc. Um, and also the prompts that are being sent to the patients and filled in, we can see the scores. And, and I just chose to copy paste the hospital anxiety depression score. And this, this score tells me here that the cutoff is at 11 and that this patient scores 18. And that's why it's uh, in red. So what I can see is before I, the patient is coming in is that gradually uh, uh, creatinine is rising and that the the hospital anxiety depression score at that moment is elevated. So it could help me to focus on, on certain topics. Um, but the electronic health record should be there for patients as well. And Marie Jose, who is one of our uh, HIV nurses, gave me permission to uh, show this. Um, well, some of the feature that it contains, uh, we call it uh, my OLVG or my chart. Um, there are SMS reminders for the appointments, uh, um, but also through emails now, um, people can book appointments, so they can uh, schedule an appointment themselves um, through the app, and also schedule appointments for blood taking, so that uh, they don't have to wait so long at the laboratory. Um, that's something that was recently introduced about six months ago. Um, patients can fill in the prompts, and they can see the blood results, and they see the blood results in another way than I do. And this is how they see, okay, 
uh, this is sodium, it's 141, it, it seems to be green. Um, and there you can see that the creatinine is maybe a little bit higher than, than average. And that's what I have to explain patients, by the way. Of course, the laboratory has normal values. And, but I try to explain how the normal values were set. And, and, and that sometimes it can be very normal for a person because it didn't change the last 10 years. Or, or that the CD4, CD8 ratio is different than in people without HIV. So that it's, it's orange in, in the app. But that's something that the computer uh, thinks and hasn't been put into perspective. Well, also, this app reminds her that she has an appointment with Dr. Terpstein, that she still has to do sodium, potassium, uh, and creatinine. Um, and in that way, uh, it helps us to deal with these 4,000 patients, and, and we're happy that uh, uh, we are not struggling a lot when it comes to the classical uh, 390s. Um, 80 percent of our patients are MSM, I have to say, and, and um, um, we, don't, we hardly have any intravenous drug users, for example. Some people are coming in now from, from uh, Romania, Poland, uh, Ukraine. Um, but it's, it's, it's a lot of highly educated persons, which makes it easier to have these figures. But you can see that the a classical being retained in care, being on ART and having an undetectable viral load is, is above uh, 99 or at least above 89, 98%. And that we can focus in many patients on, on the fourth 90, the good health related quality of life. And this is something you will probably recognize. Here on the X axis, you can see uh, um, the people in different um, categories, age categories. And of course, the moment males and females, uh, people get older, um, they have more comorbidities. And then you can see uh, on average, our patients are 50 plus. So we have quite some 50, 60, and 70 plus patients, and a and, and considerable amount of persons have one, two, or even three or four comorbidities next to the HIV. It's also shown here, we uh, use that hospital anxiety depression scale routinely, first year, uh, three times, the, every subsequent year, once a year, before the yearly checkup. And when you use not 11, but 15 as a cut off, 25% of our patients have an elevated score. And the moment we refer <clears throat> this group of patients, 92% of patients have a psychiatric diagnosis, and, and that's anxiety uh, disorders or depression, but it could be uh, uh, post-traumatic stress or, or something else. Eh? So HUTS is a screening tool and not just for anxiety and depression. Uh, but it's mental health, uh, one of the comorbidities, and what you see here now, there are not age categories, but you see uh, time frames, and that you see that during the time, uh, um, the number of people with uh, a cardiovascular risk of over 10%, the blue bars is, is rising. I think these are things that we all uh, recognize. So there's more cardiovascular risk, there's more mental health problems, uh, um, there's cancer screening and sometimes cancer treatment um, that we have to focus on still despite the good cascade of care. Um, and then it's of course also good, um, we, we see our patients, and Laura mentioned it, once every six months. And there's a lot to, to focus on when, when you look at that comorbidity <coughs> management or, or preventing comorbidities. And then it would be nice uh, to, uh, during these 363 days that, you, that our patients are not seeing a doctor or a nurse, that there are apps that can uh, empower our patients and help them. Um, and I divided that into a social app or networking apps, patient support apps, and disease and health management apps. Um, now we look at the Happy HIV app. Actually, I filled it in so you know that it was my birthday recently and uh, that I'm male and that uh, I'm... Uh, in the app I was looking for a female, but uh, uh, my wife asked me why. <laughs> <coughs> But the, the moment I filled all this in and I, and I wrote down that I was living in, uh, in Amsterdam, uh, it popped up and I could see that eight other persons were, were searching for, uh, for somebody to connect uh, with. So this is an example of a social networking uh, app. Uh, please let me know later on if, if anybody has more experience uh, by uh, patients who, who really used it. Um, well, then there's the positive uh, plus one app, and it, it got released this weekend because you could uh, pre-register. Eh? So I'm, I'm really curious. Uh, I think there's a good PR behind it because it was uh, an amazing app. They said, and, and uh, you can already prescribe and be one of the first. Uh, but it, of course, has a very good role, providing a safe, secure environment for support, friendship, <laughs> connection, and, and advocacy. And 
as we discussed this morning, there's a lot to gain there, and it's good for people to uh, to feel support and friendship. Um, the Emerge app, I think that was a, or is a very ambitious app as well. It, it was uh, developed with EU funding and there was a consortium of HIV clinics. I know that one of the clinics was in Antwerp in Belgium, so I called to colleagues that are new personally, but there they're not using it anymore. And I understand that after this <coughs> discontinuation of that fund, uh, um, it's still available in Brighton and in certain places in Croatia, and, and there people are happy with it. Um, but I couldn't see what specific functionalities are there because you have to log in and you are provided with these details uh, uh, by a healthcare professional who works uh, in, these, uh, in these clinics. But this is one that uh, I think probably it's an extension of the electronic health record. And it's also what I re uh, realize at home. What, what we're going through now is that um, we get more and more people working at the IT department and we are dependent on that, like, like banking has been dependent on them more and more. There's less people behind the desk and more people at the IT service. And so the electronic health record becomes more professional, uh, but people ask them a lot to provide the docs and the nurses in the hospital. Now there are apps coming, uh, help, helping the doctor and nurse to have a clear overview about what's going on outside of the hospital walls, to see what's going on with the patients. What we're looking at, uh, and probably uh, the Emerge app is an app like that as well. What we're also going to look at is uh, patient supporting apps, um, and that's again about these 360 plus days when there's no connection, but this is more about empowering the patient. And of course, ideally, at a certain moment, this all connects and, and you can not just read what the general practitioner wrote or the gynecologist about your patient, but also what was the input of the patient, him or herself. Um, then there's the Live for Me Plus app, um, and I made a few uh, screenshots. I, I downloaded it as well, and there's different things that people can use. Uh, the tests for HIV or se uh, several STD checks, and people can write down what, uh, what the test results uh, were. Uh, there's a digital journal with, with measurements uh, like this and diagnosis or allergies that have been uh, recorded. And there's also a periodic newsletter, uh, which is good, although it, it's... I'm not sure how interesting it is for everybody to know that there's a Ukrainian youth summer camp to be held, held in Berlin. I think it's good, but it's not, it's not going to help you with your personal health uh, management. So I think that could be more uh, tailor-made. Um, so then uh, about the Happy App, and, and of course this is going to be a little bit commercial talk maybe, but I have more uh, experience with this app and, and I want to show what our vision has been. The first release was in 2016 after we had an innovation conference in 2014 with our patients and we asked ourselves the question how can technique help uh, uh, our patients to make life easier and we would like the app to be all in one solution that centralizes knowledge and data, uh, and data in, in a simple and personal way so what we actually say is we provide people with knowledge ease and trust about how they can deal with their health and their disease and now what, uh, that could, you could have an app from your pharmacy, you could have a, a lifestyle app and a mindfulness app, and you probably have an app from the hospital or from the general practitioner. And at home we say, uh, my hospital, that's my OVG, and my pharmacy, it's a minefield, because it's all my, uh, uh, it should be all connected, which it isn't uh, yet. Um, well, I, I told you about the 363 days, and it has uh, several features in it, and I'm just going to explain a few uh, one of them uh, like I said in my hospital prompts are already sent um, in an extension from the electronic health record so there is a my OVG app where people can receive the prompts and fill it in I think that the fun thing is in, in the app here and it's freely available in the store so people from abroad can use it as well for free um, here it's not a boring 20, 30 or 60 item questionnaire, but a chatbot is asking a question and you're giving an answer. So it's, it's a fun, a, a more fun way, a less boring way of filling in uh, questions. But when you have an answer, uh, um, well, as a healthcare provider, you should or you would like to do something with the outcome. 
And well, I said 25% of our patients have an elevated score. I cannot send 1,000 patients to my psychiatrist, to, to the psychiatrist in, in the hospital. And so we have to find other ways. Uh, uh, but of course, if you measure patient reported outcomes and something is not good, you would like to solve that problem. And so you would like them to be actionable. And in the app for uh, at least mild anxiety and depression, we have an, uh, an intervention e-health tool for free. Um, there where there is a few months uh, delay uh, of people waiting list for psychologists and psychiatrists. It's run by the psychology, uh, psychology uh, faculty in Leiden and it was uh, uh, published in the Lancet HIV. For stigma, people are directed to a peer group uh, intervention that, that the PhD is now uh, writing down and publishing soon. And for loneliness, people can set up a profile. With a chatbot, people can set up a profile. What do you prefer more, nature or town, uh, alcohol or Sprite, uh, music or sports? And when there's a 70% or more match, people can be matched. We uh, um, made this uh, together with the National Patient Organization. Now, it has a lifestyle app with, with uh, factors, uh, exercise, uh, uh, food, um, alcohol, uh, <coughs> relaxation, things like that. In the food part, there is a camera. And you can take a picture of the meal, of your pasta meal, for example, and then artificial intelligence is calculating the number of calories in it. And that's something it, it can already do. When more people start filling the database anonymously, yeah, if they agree, then it can learn. That's that machine learning principle. And at a certain moment, it can offer the, the person three alternative plates of pasta with less calories because nobody stops eating pasta and almost nobody starts eating half a plate instead of a full plate. But some people uh, didn't realize that when you put other sauce on it that it also saves some calories. I'm also al almost finished. Uh, well, people can order their medication through the app. And the nice thing is that we don't have uh, 21 persons on the voicemail having to email or call them back that we arranged it with 21 different pharmacies. But there's one pharmacy that builds that medication module and, and they, once a day between three and four, tell us, okay, there are six patients today, are you still okay that we continue that prescription? Or do you, or do you first have to see blood results before you, you can uh, prolong that? And uh, more and more patients are using that service as well. Well, we had some... some uh, um, Recognition, I think, for the things we did over the last few years. Um, and happy, by the way, started in people with HIV. So happy was a HIV. Happy, it's now a health happy because it's there for chronic skin conditions, uh, liver, certain uh, uh, B9 hematology disorders, and for thyroid gland and endometriosis, it will be released in January. Um, and as you can see, now we have, uh, currently we have uh, over 2,500 active users, that, that's over 10% 10, 10 of our patient population countrywide. But people from, uh, from other places are using it as well. Portugal is rising yeah, at, at the moment. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so yeah, so this is really commercial, yeah, but uh, I'll, I'll end up with this uh, slide. And thank you for your attention.